It's been said that there's a fine line between iron-willed persistence and a total lack of self-awareness. When things start to go off course at a shop, you've got two options. Stick it out and be persistent, or take your problem somewhere else. The real problem is, you never know which choice is the right one until it's too late. That's what I've been doing for four years now on my project car. So strap in and get ready to hear all about it. A new episode of Fuel Auto Media TV, powered by Performance Engineering, is coming up. Toby here with Fuel Auto Media, helping you connect, learn, and grow in the high-performance street machine, door slammer drag car world. On this channel, we do car features, tech how-tos, interviews with industry experts, and commentaries on the automotive aftermarket, and other cool stuff just like this. So if you're new here, smash that subscribe button so you can get notified every time we drop new content. Let's get to it. In the first couple of episodes in this series, I showed you some of the planning and the parts that I selected for my late model Pro Street Mustang build. In July 2013, I bought a project car and managed to strip it down in my driveway. My wife and I rented a U-Haul open trailer and hauled it to Rich Gebhardt of Gebhardt Pro Cars in September of 2013. The verbal agreement was for a full chromoly tube chassis for $16,000 with a timeline of approximately six to nine months. I gave Rich a credit card check for 10 grand, which eventually turned out to be a pretty good thing. I'll explain why later. Things started out pretty slow, but that was planned. I wasn't sure what to expect. The car actually sat out back behind Rich's shop for the next several months. Now, if you know anything about Rich, he's built several hundred tube chassis cars from pro streets to dragsters and everything in between. I was excited to see him build mine. Now, inexperience can make you two things, naive and unprepared. I was both. I was naive because I had no idea how much it would take to build a full tube chassis car. $16,000 was a good deal for a finished chrome molly chassis, and I thought Rich was giving me a screaming deal, which he was, because we had become friends through the writing of my book, Sensory Overload. I had honored him as a legend of Pro Street at the Street Machine Nationals, but the thing is, even a finished chassis is still a far cry from a finished car, and I had no idea that it would take several times that amount to finish it. To make matters worse, verbal contracts are worthless, and I've learned that the friend and family discounts almost always end in hurt feelings and damaged relationships. At least that's been my experience. In hindsight, it would have been so much better for both of us if we would have sat down and hammered out a written agreement. It protects everyone. Speaking of writing, with the car now an official RPM Magazine project car, and with new sponsors on board every month, I needed to be writing tech features on its buildup. I managed to fill a few months worth of tech stories with pictures of parts that had been bought or had been provided for the build, and a few write-ups about where we were heading in the next few months. Companies like Hearst, NOS, S&W Race Cars, VFN, Billet Specialties, and several others all agreed to pitch in. But the truth was, there was very little progress being done on the car. To make matters worse, it was a thousand miles away. By May of 2014, I started getting a little nervous. The original plan had said that the chassis work should be nearly done by now, but in truth, it hadn't really even begun. I'm sure I became a big pest, calling and texting too much to try and plan for the articles. I had a job to do, and without information, it made it really, really hard. The longer I held out hope, the worse things got. I didn't know what to do. I made it a point to visit Rich's shop on my way back from the Street Machine Nationals in June 2014. Now the car was on the chassis table, but still light years from completion, with not even the main rails of the chassis done. The bars that were in it had been tacked in place, and it still had a long way to go. I began to get even more concerned. Now, I'll admit, the more nervous I get, the more annoying I probably become. And with Rich's shop being a thousand miles away, I was probably a pest on the phone of epic proportions. Thing is, the problem can be solved with one thing, good communication. Now, as I see it, a shop's duties are basically to provide the service that they promise, deliver it in the time that was discussed, at the price that was initially negotiated. Now, on the other hand, the customer's job is to pay promptly and to try not to get in the way with harebrained ideas or, or new or changed tasks all the time. 
Now, I won't speak for Rich, but I have no problem admitting that I was failing to hold up at least my part of the bargain. I wanted answers, and I wanted to see progress. Now, at this point, it became pretty clear that I needed to pull it out. There are a couple of problems with pulling a car from a shop. First, unless you kept good records, it's been my experience that at least some of the parts you left or had shipped there, they won't make it out. Whether intentional or not, parts get lost, they walk away, they get mixed up with other customers' projects. The second problem is timing. For example, if you go out to eat on a busy Friday night and the wait's 25 minutes at the first restaurant, but you get impatient and you leave after about 20 minutes and you go to the restaurant next door and you do it all over again, Ultimately, it's gonna take you longer to eat than it would have if you would have just sat it out. Now, the problem with a project car is you never know if you're gonna to get to eat or not. You're literally at their mercy. And in many cases, you have no way of knowing until it's been months, or in some cases, I've heard even years down the road. I kept pressuring Rich for progress, and we were getting nowhere. He was working a full-time job as a bus driver for the state by day, and he didn't seem to have the time or the ability to put in those long hours to finish the chassis. To be honest with you, I really felt sorry for him. I knew that he was overcommitted and I didn't want to be a burden. It was actually Rich's idea for me to take the car out and put it in another shop. My hope was that a new shop could get me in quickly and finish what Rich had already started. RPM had featured Ron Bookman's incredible Dart Vader Pro Charge Dodge that had been built by Virginia Rod Company. Shop owner Donald Williams had met with my editor at a show and he seemed ready, willing, and eager to take over our bill. He offered to do the work on the car for just $25 an hour. After talking it over, I decided it was time to make the switch. Rich actually loaded up the car and most all the parts. And he hauled it to Cincinnati where he met up with Donald and Ronald who hauled it back to Newport News, Virginia. I struggled with my emotions. I was crushed that Rich couldn't finish the car. As I told you, I really wanted him involved. But when Donald told me that the work I had now paid $13,000 total for was basically unusable, I was furious. Now there's another thing I've discovered about shops. Oftentimes, there's a risk involved for the new shop in using other people's work. So it's not often that they want to build upon other people's stuff as often as they want to just start from scratch. I felt taken advantage of. I'd lost an entire year and nearly a quarter of my original budget. And I literally had nothing to show for it but the shell of a Mustang. Now, I eventually got my money back from Rich and Donald's shop eventually built a new dual rail chassis. But they say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. I took my same mistakes to Virginia and I ended up with a similar result two years later. More on that in another episode. Tip of the week. 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 Tip of the week, put it in writing. I can't stress this enough. If you're having work done on your car, put it in writing. Now the shop can charge a per job fee or an hourly rate, either way. Hammer that out up front, put it in writing. Leaving parts to be used, put those in writing. Both parties should sign for that. It protects you both and it ensures that what we communicate is clearly accepted by both parties. Any shop that hesitates to put their commitments in writing shouldn't be trusted. By the same token, any customer who refuses to put their commitments in writing is probably one you ought to pass on if you're a shop owner. The point is, the overwhelming majority of misunderstandings that I've had on my project car could have been completely avoided if I would have insisted on a written contract. What about you? What's the most valuable lesson having a project car has ever taught you? Tell me about it in the comments below. And be sure to subscribe to this channel as I take you step by step through every misstep that I've made along the way. If you're watching on Facebook, you're already behind. I post weekly content to YouTube and share the same later on Facebook. So be sure to surf on over to fuelmediachannel.com to subscribe and to see it all. Until next time, this is Toby with Fuel Auto Media telling you to take the blame, give the praise, keep going, do better, and build something awesome. Peace.